Welcome to Journaling with Nature, the podcast for those who want to turn curiosity into wonder, a pencil sketch into a rabbit hole of discovery, a moment of stillness into a life full of joy. I'm your host, Bethan Burton. Let's open the pages of our nature journals and explore this world together. Hello, this is episode 124. I'm so thrilled to share this interview with you today because I'm speaking with fellow Aussie and nature lover, Hannah Jones. Hannah is passionate about native Australian plants and started her business, Wattle and Wonder, as a way to help people fall in love with our unique flora and landscapes. In our conversation, we spoke about why Hannah is so drawn to native Australian plants, the different ways that she connects people with plants through her work, nature journaling as a tool for learning, and creating havens for wildlife through habitat gardening. Let's listen. Hannah, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Thanks, Bethan. <laughs> I feel like this has been in the making for a really long time. <laughs> oh, it has, yeah. I appreciate your patience No, and your perseverance. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you're the one who's patient with me. I feel, I haven't said this on the podcast before, but I feel like I cancel every guest, cancel and reschedule <laughs> every guest at least one time. <laughs> terrible but we're here and I'm so excited to chat with you and learn about your story and I'd love to start as I always do with stories of early connection to nature and I wonder if you can trace your passion back to early nature experiences and I'd love to hear some stuff about what you experienced in your early years that relates to nature. Yeah I love that you open with this question and I'm always yeah, keen to hear what other people have to say about this and it makes me reflect on mine. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think my my garden at home, my dad um, had, like, he put a lot of love into his garden when we, um, in one of the houses that we used to live in and I just have lots of memories about spending time in that garden and watching him take care of things in the garden, picking the strawberries and, um, yeah, I remember, like, getting in a bit of trouble for... <laughs> Picking the, you know, he's waited months and months for this flower <laughs> to open and I'd go and pick it straight away and give it to him as a present and he'd be like, oh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> so I think that um, has contributed to it. Yeah. Also, I think um, we used to live in central New South Wales when I was a kid at some point and my best friend in primary school, uh, her family was had a property that was next to the Goulburn River or it had the Goulburn River running through it right up next to the National Park. And I've got so many beautiful memories of catching the school bus back to her house, which felt like it took three hours to get there and a full drive track up her driveway. And you'd get there and it was just absolute beautiful native bushland. Um, we would just spend hours outside exploring. And I remember going down to the riverbanks, collecting clay and bringing it up to their studio shed and we'd like build wizards and, you know, little creatures and things like that out of the clay from the river. And yeah, lots and lots of really lovely memories from that time. Yeah. Those are fantastic memories. Thank you for sharing those. I feel like that you, you were talking about the garden and having someone in the garden just doing their quiet tending to nature. I've been reflecting on that quite a lot lately of just – our need to care for plants I don't mm. I don't know I mean it's clearly that's inbuilt in you but um I remember yeah I I have had all, always had this feeling like I just need to have a plant to care for and I think that that's really inbuilt in lots of people and and it sounds like you were role modeled that and I really enjoyed hearing that story yeah yeah I, I agree I think um yeah, I do enjoy now as an adult, like taking care of plants and spe I think spending time yeah. with plants. Yeah. yeah, yeah, whether that's in the garden or in the bush. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. And so you've worked in the conservation and environmental management sector for many, many years, and I I would love to hear the story of how that came to be. And I wonder if it was obvious to you after school which direction you wanted to go in, or t tell me a little about your path how all that started 
Yeah, it definitely was not obvious. Okay. To me. <laughs> um, yeah, it definitely wasn't obvious to me. I left high school. I didn't even finish high school. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to work. I was just love yeah. working. So I spent a long time uh, in hospitality, mm-hmm. um, jumping from job to job, as you do in that industry, and then did quite a bit of travel. Um, I did some travel overseas, and but when I was overseas, I kind of was really <laughs> wanting to travel my own backyard. Like yeah. I kind of had the desire to come yeah. home and Oh, I haven't even really explored my own backyard in, in Australia. So I was quite keen to come back and do that. And so that's what I did. Um, and I always love camping and like road trips and just, you know, and, and bushwalking. I did always really like bushwalking. Uh, but, yeah, I went up to the Northern Territory and I ended up living there for about 18 months. I was just meant to be passing through, but it just it grabbed me. Mm-hmm. It was, yeah, a really special place. And there was a lot of, uh, I went through a big sort of transformational period, I guess, when I was up there and a lot of growth. Um, Met some amazing, really special people that were really aligned with their path um, in life and they were just so inspirational Um, and going on lots of bush adventures and, um, and, yeah, growing all our food at home and working in the community garden and, um yeah it was a really special time so I think probably so that was in my early 20s when I was up there and that really kind of shifted you know or made made it a bit more obvious Mm. you know the path that I wanted to be on so I did some volunteering up there with um Conservation Volunteers Australia that was a great experience um yeah learned a lot about permaculture and and veggie gardening uh And, yeah, I came back to South Australia where I live now um, and where I was before. So I came back to South Australia and started studying horticulture, uh, a little bit of landscape design as well. And then that kind of quickly led into conservation land management. I really quickly realised I had, I didn't want anything to do with any other plant unless it was native. (laughs) (laughs) Interesting. Yeah. So I was giving, get given given assignments (laughs) to... um, you know, do studies on plants. And I was just so not interested. I was like, I only, yeah, I just was only interested in native plants. So then I was like, oh, I think maybe I should be studying conservation land management rather than the horticultural path. Um, And, yeah, just from there I started volunteering uh, locally here with, like, Greening Australia and working in native plant nurseries. Got a few seasonal jobs doing uh, revegetation and some contracting work, that kind of thing, until I've finally sort of landed at Trees for Life, who I've, and I've been with them for about six years now. So, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about Trees for Life and their mission and what their work involves? Yeah, so they're a South Australian organisa- uh, conservation organisation um, and they're a non-for-profit. They are all about making a difference in the landscape through revegetation, through bush care, uh, they've got lots of volunteering opportunities, so it's a huge volunteer base. Um, yeah, so they so volunteers can grow native plants for local farmers or local landowners, and they revegetate the landscape with that. I work in their Bush for Life program, which is all about looking after the patches of remnant bushland and removing the weeds or the threats uh, from in there, and trying to encourage the bush to bounce back. So rather than getting in there and putting in plants, we're encouraging that regeneration of the native plants that already exist in there. So I love that side of conservation. I think the tree planting is a very sexy, (laughs) enticing (laughs) part of conservation that gets a lot of attention. But for me, it's the bush regeneration work that I think is extremely valuable. Yeah. That's so interesting. So the difference is um, removing the barriers to the growth of native plants that are already in the seed bank, is that right? Yeah, so it's usually got a pretty well-structured vegetation community of native plants, Um, but then there's weeds that are coming in and they're threatening, like, you know, won't give the native plants an opportunity to spread their seed and and do their thing. Um, So we come in and remove the weed threat so that the native plants basically have room to breathe and they can set seed and produce that next generation uh, without 
having to fight for it as hardly. As hard. yeah. yeah, I love that. Wow, that's so cool. And so let's go back a little. You said that um, you didn't want to know about plants that weren't native and I, I <laughs> <laughs> it makes me smile. I understand it. Australian native plants, are, there's something magical about them, isn't there? Mm, tell mm. me about, tell me what you love about native plants. Oh, it's, I just can't understand how people don't love them. <laughs> <laughs> And if you have chosen a different type of plant, I think <laughs> I can, I can give you a suggestion for a native plant that will, <laughs> that will fill that, that, oh, that need. The niche. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I just think they are so beautiful. Like they have the most interesting designs. There's so much diversity. They're really hardy, a lot of them, like they're survivors. Mm -hmm. Uh, They've been here for a really long time. Uh, and I, I think it's the, it's the ruggedness and Mm -hmm. the beauty, softness in the same, in the same instance. Yeah. I just think they're beautiful. And I, I'm really interested in the relationships that, our native plants have with our native wildlife, um, particularly like the insects. And the, mm. I'm just starting to learn more about the insects' interactions and, you know, what what type of species they rely on and what's their job in the landscape kind of thing. So, yeah, I just think they're – we're so lucky. We're so lucky to be to be in Australia and to, to have this incredible landscape with this, you know, ancient – ancient yeah it's just ancient land with so much diversity and beauty I agree I absolutely agree I think native plants are so unique and yeah quirky in a way some of them are really quirky (laughs) yeah they've got a lot of character yeah 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 I I I think as well like maybe um uh like Mae Gibbs Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. yeah who who does all the snuggle pot and cuddle pie stuff I think she's probably had a big influence on yeah, so um, for listeners who don't know, Mae Gibbs was an illustrator and she did. She had some characters that were based on native flora and some little baby, chubby little babies that were wearing um, hats made <laughs> out of gum nuts and mm. um, there were people made out of banksias. And, yeah, it was it's very influential for um, Australians, this this series. Yeah, yeah. I want to see more of that kind of thing. I think... Um, you often see, yeah, like the animals, like Australian native animals are often, you know, characterised and brought to life through pictures and Mm humanised. But plants are really, other than the May Gibbs stuff, like there's not really a lot to draw from. And I think it's actually a really important key in getting kids to connect with our native plants, not just the native animals because they're very drawn to them. But, yeah, I think those storybooks for kids that can include yeah that build the empathy through like humanizing it's a weird concept but yeah kind of humanizing the plants yeah yeah that's so interesting and you and I had a little conversation on a chat a very long time ago about this concept called plant awareness disparity and yes. this is a concept which is so interesting that you know we have the charismatic animals the ones that everybody notices and yet we'll happily just walk past uh plants and not notice them and yeah yeah this is this is maybe part of the problem hey I think so and I often come back to this uh concept I guess you'd call it Mm -hmm. yeah plant awareness disparity so used to be referred to as plant blindness Mm -hmm. um but yeah it's really interesting I always bring it up in my workshops and because I just think it's such an yeah important it's almost like a missing link yeah it just yeah, so when people are looking at the at the bush or or in a garden, they might just see plants, and that's the end. That's they that's label the, the whole thing process. as plants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plants. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and I look at the bush, and I am I naming every yeah. single plant that I'm can see that I know. Like yeah. I'm, and then I'm thinking about what is that plant doing? Is it flowering? Is it seeding? Is there anything visiting the flowers? Is you know, how long has it been there for? Like I'm sort of thinking it's really hard, yeah, it's really hard not to, not to keep going with it. Yeah. Um, and I think when you can name something and identify something, then it builds a stronger connection to it. So, yeah, that plant awareness disparity, I think it is worth 
um, a bigger conversation around. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And this is an interesting concept about naming. I've had this chat to others about whether naming something or looking something up in a book uh, takes away from the experience of connecting with that plant. But it sounds like for you, knowing a name of a plant is almost like being introduced to it in some way as if it was um, another person or, you know, make a, make a deeper connection by naming. Yeah, and I definitely have um, thought about that as well where it can- the naming process could also be a bit of a stop Mm -hmm. as well. You Mm -hmm. could just, once you've pigeonholed it, like, oh, that's that, that's that, that's that, Um, then you kind of stop. But for me personally, I definitely feel as though I'm I'm looking at the story of that plant as well Um, and the seasonal changes, like that's really interesting to me. So, yeah, it's it's the first step. The naming is a first step because, yeah, you don't want to take away from just enjoying experiencing the plant yeah yeah Yeah. but I do feel the same way as you I feel like when I know when I've had an experience with a plant and then named it and explored it maybe done some research about it I feel like I have made I yeah I feel like that's the introduction and the next time I see it I I I think oh yeah that's that's my that's my friend you know that's my yeah yeah totally and I think the same applies to like a group of of people of humans like if you if you cast your eyes over a huge you know 50 people your brain just kind of wouldn't and you didn't know any of them like yeah your brain won't break it down and into individual personalities um but if you knew them and if you could put a name to them and a bit of a back story to them then that's you're bridging that connection to that person and it and that crowd of people feels totally different to you yeah absolutely yeah absolutely do you have favorite native plants all of them (laughs) (laughs) I um oh it is so difficult I think it definitely changes and I definitely catch myself saying to people oh this is my favorite this is my my favorite native plant (laughs) and then I'll yeah this is my favorite native plant um I'm I'm particularly fond of Banksy's I think yeah, they're just kind of like dinosaur plants yep. to me. They're incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really love uh, Themida triandra, the kangaroo grass. Okay, yeah. yeah. I love that grass. It would have originally, you know, covered a lot of the Adelaide Plains where where I live near now. Um, and, yeah, I just think about how beautiful that would have been, just like a sea of kangaroo grass yes. like that. Um, yeah, and and classic like just eucalyptus trees, mm-hmm. they amaze me. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm obsessed with mine in my front, <laughs> yes, because they support so much life. And every day I go and pretty much every day I go out and, and have a look at it, um, and just to see what's interacting with it what's on the leaves, what's on the bark, what's in the flowers. Has it started developing gum nuts yet? And it's like kind of like almost the highlight of my. I think if I had to like choose a subject that I have nature journaled the most, it would be eucalyptus leaves. Yeah, you could just draw eucalyptus leaves for the Forever. rest of your life, and you would, <laughs> and you would always come up with a different, you know, something yeah. different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I They're often incredible. when I do workshops, I just go out into my front yard and I'll gather up a basket full of eucalyptus leaves of the same off the same tree, and all of them they they're all the similar color. And mm. all of them are so unique. They're so beautiful. Mm. And so I'll just present my students with a box of eucalyptus leaves and, and we just explore it. And you can – that's enough, you know? It's enough. Yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> They're incredible. Yeah. And I think I just am amazed at their energy. Yeah. Like they grow so fast. And you think about how many leaves are on a eucalyptus tree. Um, they just absorb all that energy from the sun and it just – it pumps through its system and it grows so fast and um yeah they're incredible and then the one of the coolest things is like when you have a look at their seed pods and you shake out some seed the seed is like sand like it is like one seed is like a tiny speck of sand if that and within that seed has the the potential dna yeah to grow this 20 meter red gum like I just that blows me away yeah and the and there'd be like 
you know, thousand that one tree would could could grow thousands and thousands of trees. Like it's incredible. Yeah. That that feeling of holding a seed and thinking about the potential, I find that really moving. And so part of your work um, has as a volunteer and as a worker for um, Trees for Life Australia has been gathering seeds, right? Could you want to talk mm-hmm. a little about that process of gathering seeds and then and then germinating them and tending to them and then replanting? Yeah, so this is relatively new um, sort of endeavour for me, I guess, the seed collecting side of things. So, yeah, I have been grow- – I've grown for Trees for Life for a few years as part of their volunteer program. So that's been a great learning curve and a great experience mm-hmm. to be doing something like that and then handing those plants over. Um, very, yeah, rewarding. Um from for me personally, like with my business, Waddle and Wonder, like I've started now collecting seed and growing plants at home um, to sell to as part of my business, mm-hmm. and that's been really fun. It's definitely a, a bit of an experiment, <laughs> and I do like like working with nature is so challenging. Like yep. you're always you're always at the mercy of nature. Yep. You don't get and, to choose necessarily no, what happens. <laughs> yeah, and you have to be extremely op- um, opportunistic mm-hmm. as well. So there's only things that have a small window of opportunity for collecting the seed. Um, and then there's all these systems and, you know, methods of, of cleaning the seed and storing the seed. And then there's a whole nother lot of procedures for ger- getting that seed to germinate as well. So that's really interesting, like all the different techniques that they have. What sort uh, of techniques? Is it like freezing or burning or something like that? Yeah, so things like um, smoke water mm-hmm. can be used to trigger the germination in, in some seeds, like scarification as well. Wow. Some seeds will need that. Uh, some seeds need boiling hot water applied wow. for 12 hours and then you can plant <laughs> it. Some of them need hot water for X amount, you know, for half an hour and then cold water and then and then try and plant it. Yeah. So it is such a huge journey and you get so invested yes. as well. So yeah I've been it's hard not to uh not become disheartened when you're learning on the go with this yeah. kind of thing. um because yeah you'll spend all this time going to collect the seed cleaning storing propagating germinating <laughs> transplanting and then you put them on your growing bench and then like last night snails came oh, and ate yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> some of my plants are so <laughs> Is the worst oh, no. feeling. Oh, but so I haven't done native seedlings, but I've had, a, you know, veggie seedlings that I've just been so invested in. And then you'll just, yeah. you, I go out there like you every day and just check on them and you, yeah. they become like your little babies. Your and your babies. <laughs> I go out there in the morning and like they're all little stems, opossums oh. come down in the night and just yeah. had a little munch on all of the tops. Oh, it's no. awful. <laughs> it is. It's actually really made me realize as well because uh, I've definitely been guilty of buying some native seedlings um, from a nursery and and then I've had um, such good intentions of putting them in the yes, ground straight away and then I just haven't and yep. they've ended up sort of you know withering away next to the garden bed um, and then they go into the green bin and then you do it, try again later yeah I imagine that happens a lot with a lot of people and I think since working with with Trees for Life and sort of understanding the process a Mm. bit better, it's totally changed my (laughs) appreciation and my care (laughs) factor. (laughs) That's so good and so interesting. I now understand the seasonal, you know, how much effort Mm. and um, resources goes into actually getting that seedling to a stage where it can be planted in the ground. And, uh, yeah, now the thought of things just um, withering away is like, oh, that can't that happen. Can't... <laughs> that absolutely it becomes happen. a priority. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that journey of the seed is pretty incredible. Yeah. It's yeah. wonderful that you've seen that from the beginning to to then being put in the soil and then taking mm. off from there. That's an amazing thing. And um, so I think I – if I understand correctly, you've got sites that you go to again and again that you can um, sort of see and witness the changes over time. I'd love to hear a little about that, sort of investing yourself in one area, one site. 
Yeah, so with Trees for Life, um, my role is has been around, yeah, going to these patches of remnant bushland and they've all been based in this uh, area along the Fleury Peninsula in, in South Australia. Um, and, yeah, the, I have the same uh, number of sites every year, like the same sites that I go and visit every year. Uh, and it's been such a... It's probably my, been my favourite part of the whole job is actually having the opportunity to watch the seasons mm. shift and change and it kind of takes a whole 12 months for you to wrap your head around what's going on on the site, what's what's popping up when, mm. um, you know, what how how it's all functioning and then you build the next year on those last 12, mm. on those last 12 months. So there's not many jobs like that where you have to kind of wait this whole year. Yes. Um, to kind of feel like, okay, now I, I can understand. step up. Yeah, I sort of have a deeper understanding. And then that just builds every year. Um, and it's just, it has been my absolute favourite part of the job of, of yeah, having that opportunity to to witness nature, like at, at nature's pace, yeah. Absolutely. I wonder if you could set the scene of your landscape, what sorts of plants you see around you, what sorts of things, uh, what sorts of habitats you have close by? Yeah, so we're we're pretty lucky here. We um so we're on the Fleury Peninsula, uh, on Ghana country. We live in Aldinga Beach, where we're sort of in between um, Aldinga Scrub. There's like a conservation park right near us, and then we've got the beach just down the road. We've got an incredible uh, ephemeral wetland behind us as well. Wow. Yeah, so it's really, really special. Unfortunately, South Australia has absolutely copped it in terms of land clearance. Okay. Um, so we're land clearance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think we've lost something like 97% wow. in the um, southern Mount Lofty Ranges and Fleury Peninsula. It's a lot. So what we've got left is very fragmented. Um, so, but we, what we do have, so yeah, Dinga Scrub's really, really special to me. Um, it's in the sand dunes but it's covered it's just absolutely chockers with with native plants and and habitat it's really important little little spot in there um yes so some of the plants that we have in in our local region are uh like the grass trees which are mm -hmm. incredible they just that's feel, another native uh, yeah you know, a native um that's my other plant. favorite native plant yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yes, for me that's like so uh, quintessentially Australian. Yes, yeah, totally agree. Yeah, they're incredible. I love how, yeah, they're, they're so slow growing. And these the ones that we have here don't really have trunks. So further down the coast we have the ones with the trunks. Um, mm -hmm. But where I am they kind of stick close to the ground and they're just like they're the old sort of people of the bush yeah, totally. like they've, seen, so they've seen it all they've yep. seen it all and I love how after a fire goes through they they're built for it and they're like the first responders I always feel like so they're like that as soon as you know as soon as that fire's kind of finished and they recover their flower spikes come up and then they're producing nectar for the wow, for the, the birds sex and the pollinators and little visitors to support them until the other plants kind of come mm. to play again. I just, yeah, they're incredible. I love that. Yeah, they're so important. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we get a few banksias. We've got, um, yeah, pink, lots of pink gum in there. She oaks, which I also love. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and then up in the Mount Lofty Ranges, it's lots of stringy bark forest. Uh, we've got um, the grey box grassy woodlands as well, which would have been probably most of the Adelaide Plains kind of region and the sort of foothills so yeah we've got we've still got it there but it's very fragmented unfortunately yeah well that makes the work that you've been doing all the more important yeah yeah so I'd love to hear about taking the next step and creating your, your business going into it the challenges the joys of it the whole experience of creating Wattle and Wonder yeah, so it's definitely started out as my little passion project. Yeah. Um, so where Trees for Life is kind of focused on providing opportunities for you to take action um, and take care of the land, Waddle and Wonder was more about, it's more about sort of sparking the, 
the connection and the, and yeah. the love and the why. Um, like, why should I go and take action? Why should I go and volunteer with, with those guys? Because um, I just think if you don't, if you haven't experienced that, if you haven't experienced like the magic of native bushland, then you're not going to be motivated to help take care of it. Yes. So, yeah, there was a quote that I came across um, by Baba Dayong, I think you pronounce it, uh, and it was, in the end, we will conserve only what we love, we will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we are taught. Mm. And that is my biggest driver for the business. Like as soon as I heard that, it just sort of clicked something yeah. in my mind. I was like, okay, that's it. That's That sums it all up for me really. Um, and it really has been my biggest motivator for for the business. Yeah. Yeah. And so your business has lots of different arms. So uh, maybe you can say <laughs> branches. Uh, branches, that's more yeah. appropriate. <laughs> I like that. Um, one of them is teaching nature journaling. I'd love to hear you about your nature journal story, how you came to nature journaling. Was it something you saw someone doing and thought, oh, that's a cool idea? Was it something you stumbled across? How did you come to it? Yeah, so I definitely stumbled across it. I think it was actually you, Bethan. Oh, really? <laughs> introduced <laughs> me to nature journaling. And I can't quite remember exactly how or when, but it was during my um, pretty hazy postpartum period with my first, with my little boy, Ellis. So, yeah, those first few months of just, you know, kind of, it, it was in winter, just sitting by the fire, breastfeeding, yep. Instagramming. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I know it well. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's kind of where I was at. And I think I might have just come across you somehow on Instagram. Uh, and I thought, oh, that looks great. Like that like looks like something I would absolutely love to wow. do. And I was really missing being out in the bush and I was really actually missing work. Like I just love the work that I do. Yeah. So yeah. I was missing that. Um, and But I had millions probably of photos of native plants in my phone yeah so that's kind of where I started like I think I started I came across you on Instagram and I thought that looks really cool and I wouldn't consider myself an artist but I am a very creative person so I've got sketchbooks and things like that and yeah yeah I just started when I was you know nap trapped on the couch <laughs> I'd pull out a sketchbook and and just pull out a, a photo on my phone and and sketch that that flower or that plant and and then I've got a, lots of uh, native plant books and resources and resources so I would just start studying and taking notes so I wasn't actually doing it out in nature but I was doing what I could with what I had yeah uh, and I just yeah I loved it I loved the um the mix between the art world and the science world mm -mm. when I was growing up like particularly in high school I felt like it was a very segregated you either were good at art and English or you were good at math and science. And I always learned the art and English, which made me sort of shut down the possibility of math and science, I think. So I just love that nature journaling is this blend of science and, and art. Um, it was really, yeah, quite a nice little, like overcoming that was, yeah, it was quite good for me, yeah. I love that story. I didn't know that that you, it was the Instagram <laughs> that that was the introduction. That's so. I mean, yeah, early parenthood is just all, all so all consuming. But I do remember that feeling of like, I want, I want to expand in some way, and yes. that you could do that in in whatever way was available to you at that moment was, is really wonderful. And and then it's just grown and grown and now you're teaching nature journaling. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to hear about your workshops and about, yeah, what you see, what what you experience when you're introducing this magical practice to someone else and you sort of see that spark jump from you to them. Yes. I'd love to hear about that. Yeah. So I'm a little bit sneaky with my nature journaling workshops because I am – sort of using nature journaling as a tool to educate people about native plants. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess, again, I'm very aware of my bias. <laughs> <laughs> There's it, nothing wrong with that. Yeah. <laughs> I can justify it. Till the, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I kind of use it as a tool. Um, it's a really powerful tool, as you yeah. would, would know, um, for learning and connecting. 
Yes. Um, so, yeah, basically I've been running workshops where uh, some of them have been outside. A lot of them have actually been indoors and I've mm -hmm. got access, you know, my garden and um, and friends' gardens where I take cuttings of native plants and I bring them along to the workshop. And so there's like a big, you know, display of native plants for us to choose from and then I'll kind of step through the processes of, of nature journaling and and what we can sort of get out of it mm. but sort of it's like almost like little native plant studies where we'll focus on one native plant and I'll get them to really connect with it and noticing all those tiny little details which I think is that's where the magic is those yes. details um, and every workshop feels so special like it is a really yeah really special experience there's always a moment sort of once you get over the introductions and the hows and this is how you do it and and uh you know all the instructional part of it where we actually just are drawing yeah and it's silent yes and it's like this magical moment of focus yeah. and and attention and um and they they've dropped out from what from where they actually are and I like I love that moment it's like a little you get like a little hit from it it's like really it feels so good to be able to gift that to people in a world where it's yeah. very rare where you find those moments yeah. sometimes it's so quiet you can just hear pencil scratching yeah. on the paper it's magic isn't it it is it's so lovely yeah <laughs> yeah it's special yeah yeah or and and sometimes you get a participant or a few participants who are just like so in the flow with it and they suddenly you can see that, okay, this person's going to take this away and they're going to make it part of their lives because they've just grasped the concept really deeply. Do you experience yes, that? I do. I get, I've had a few people get annoyed that the workshop's finished. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I have really lovely people that w might send me an email afterwards and um, they've taken their journal and because I always – I usually – with the workshops gift people a, a blank sketchbook so in the hope that they keep doing continue. it continue yeah that's great I like that yeah so yeah I always love getting pictures of of that people that have done that it's so it's so cool yeah yeah and do you have people who come to the workshops with you know nervous about making marks on paper oh yeah like yeah. pretty much everyone there might yeah. be like one or two in the in the group that are confident drawers yeah they're always quietly confident they never yep. broadcast <laughs> and all of a sudden you look over this shoulder and you're like oh my gosh making a masterpiece there yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I actually really love it when no one when yeah when people are kind of uh they don't consider themselves artistic yep. and they're freaking out a bit because that's yep. actually the whole point of yep. yeah so I love that line I think it was John Muir Laws I think I heard it, him say it where it's we're drawing to learn we're not learning to draw yes I always preface my workshops with that and um yeah always let them know hey guess what I'm not an art teacher <laughs> I'm a plant yes. person, not an art teacher um but nature journaling is like that tool for for yeah the creative inquiry and um yeah I so I always start my workshops by doing blind contour yes. drawings because it's hilarious yes, <laughs> it always starts, absolutely. starts things really lightly uh and it also kind of sets the bar really low for the rest yes. of the drawing <laughs> <laughs> so then every drawing they do after that they feel good about because yeah. it's they were allowed to look at the paper <laughs> yep I do the and, same yeah. thing I think it's great to start laughing to yes. start off laughing and I think yeah. that you can't you can't help it with a blind contour <laughs> yeah yeah and that actually always my probably my favorite job. yes yeah they're so cool yeah many many of my finished nature journal pages started as a blind contour and I think oh that looks kind of cool and I just add color and keep going and yeah. it turns into something yeah yeah I'm wondering for you personally what the biggest benefits of the practice are what do you take from it most uh I think I it just sort of gets things a bit I, get, I think it deepens my understanding of what I'm looking at mm. it encourages that that next level of inquiry uh, it's probably helped actually with what we were talking about before with the the naming of plants yeah um, 
I guess like the nature journaling kind of fosters this, okay, but what else? Okay, yes. but what else? Yeah. Yes, so, yes. Um, those three prompts, the I, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, they're kind of, they're stuck in my brain yeah, forever now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so I think the yeah the the deeper understanding of what I'm observing also just to, that little reminder to actually just yeah. slow down mm -hmm. um, yeah and soak it and you yeah it's like a soaking kind of feeling mm -hmm. like you soak it you soak it in yeah I definitely need to prioritize some more nature journaling time for myself I think yeah, with the business and with my family life and and trees for life and everything, it's this big fast moving machine right now. Yes, and yes. And I'm excited for this time of year, like autumn's really settling in and just to be able to uh yeah, venture off into the bush and, and do some more journaling for myself. Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely know that feeling and sometimes I'll look back on the last month two months three months even and just think did I actually nature journal for me yeah oh gosh and then you have to yeah. <laughs> remember to build that into your day because it's something so nourishing and yet something that gets pushed to the sidelines when you've got the next yes. very important busy thing on your schedule and... yeah yeah absolutely yeah so you mentioned before about watching the sites change over the year and how you can observe that through the year and I wonder if you take notes do you actually write down times and dates and things and if nature journaling has been useful for recording that change that seasonal change yeah no I definitely have and it's yeah so I was keeping a journal for each a different journal for each season mm -hmm. um, when I was had more time for journaling so I'd have one for autumn one for spring um, so then I could flick back through and start to pick up on the patterns and the and the triggers in yeah. nature because that is yeah. really interesting to me. Um, yeah, so and I am a bit of a kind of nature nerd in the sense of like I like to get all the information and, mm -hmm. and document it and write it down. So, yeah, I'd, I'd love the time to actually sit down and catalogue all these photos and, mm. and you know, organise them by season and, yeah, I was putting together a bit of a, like a bit of a folder around each month of the year and sort of just jotting down all my little nature notes around, you know, what was flowering, what was seeding, what birds did I notice, what insects did I notice because uh, I just, I think that information is so valuable. Like it does, you're not really, I'm not really receiving anything for it but I it makes me feel I guess it probably just makes me feel more connected yeah to the to the land and um to me it just it's like yeah growing food I feel the same about growing food I think it's really important to grow food and to understand that process and I think the same kind of applies to noticing the seasonal shifts in your local environment and it just kind of feels very I guess grounding and and more it makes me feel a bit more secure i guess yeah yeah, yeah. i totally understand that i've had I, some several years ago i sort of analyzed this thing that i've inherited from i don't know from british mm. you know culture which is that we have four seasons yeah and and realized actually we that's not even no. applicable here and <laughs> yeah. and so then I had this feeling like oh I, I want I need and want to know what it is that's happening around me through the year and mm -hmm. how my season these seasons here can be characterized and understood mm -hmm. and so I spend a lot of time thinking about that and observing and so you say that it's autumn. We like we we still talk like that. We still talk like yeah. with the four seasons because it's sort of in inbuilt or ingrained in our thinking. And and I think like that too. But more and more, I'm coming to notice and appreciate and understand and want to know more about the changes over the year around me, especially because we sort of we're in this place that we we have lived for some time and plan to live for a long time mm. and so learning this landscape and and noticing and I've noticed 
you know, we sort of, with this British mindset, mm-hmm. we sort of think about, okay, so in the spring, everything comes to life. In the summer, you're enjoying it. In the yeah. autumn, all the leaves fall. That doesn't even happen here. But, um, you know, this is the sense like we're getting ready for winter and then we uh, have this dormant period in winter. And it's not like that. And I've noticed that here, particularly around me at the moment, heaps and heaps and heaps of things are flowering in mm. what we what we call autumn mm. whereas that's not it doesn't match with the sort of colonial idea of autumn yes yeah. i don't know if you if you oh, notice totally. that the things are flowering and if you if this that is like speaks the most to you. magic yeah this is the magic time to be out in the bush like autumn yeah. winter and i actually think our dormant period really is kind of summer summer yeah because yeah, those plants are just they're just holding on like <laughs> won't really see much in flower because yeah. they're just riding out that dry hot summer heat yeah um but then and then yeah i totally understand about that very colonial you know timing of the seasons and I I often think about one day in the future we'll be like in the middle of our you know our spring or something and we'll be thinking oh it's spring all the flowers are going to be opening and all this and it'll be like pouring with rain every day because it's it's going to be like it is it's already so out yeah Yeah. it's changing yeah 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 locked in calendar year Mm -hmm. um but like today we went for a bushwalk this morning actually and you can see the shift has occurred and I felt like okay it is what we know as autumn now like I can I can accept that now (laughs) yeah 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 I mean there are there are these there is a rhythm to it and I'm just trying and I've sort of invested myself in the process of for the rest of my lifetime understanding what the seasons mean here yeah in this place yes yeah yeah and the yeah those that knowledge is is so important and it's known as well like the first nations people yes here like they know all of that they yes. you know that's such incredible knowledge that's only been attained through you know tens of thousands of years of, of observation yes. and connection and i just think far out like that's yeah. incredible that's incredibly moving, and we're so it? late to the game like we're so yes. so late to the game um uh, but yeah I just am so in awe of that ecological knowledge that mm. first nations people have maintained and continue to to practice it's yeah pretty remarkable yeah Absolutely, absolutely. So another branch of your business is that you run sessions for kids and you call it Little Bushies and I just love this <laughs> so much. And I, I'm, I feel that um, I feel the strong importance, like you talked about, you know, being there with plants and the knowledge that, that you can gather over a lifetime. And I'm, I'm wondering about your thoughts on the importance of nature experiences in children and what sort of short-term and long-term benefits that brings to kids and families. Yeah, so Little Bushies has been really fun and it's it's kind of for the grown-ups as much as it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it is quite focused on, on babies. So mm-hmm. it was starting to – I was like expanding the age bracket to toddlers as well but – um, because as my little boy got older and he was coming along, but then it got to a point where he was. <laughs> I want to go home. <laughs> yes. Yeah. He was having a he was having a two year old meltdown. Yeah, yeah. Halfway through and you're the trying walk to work. And other mums were trying to feed him their snacks, and he wasn't having a bar of it. And it was just okay. Let's just let's have a break from little bushies for a bit. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, I'm sort of focusing now more on like that that baby and and parent connection within nature. Uh, and it's a very sort of sensory based bushwalk. Um, so yeah, we're looking at things that babies can touch and smell and, and hear and, and just tapping into those senses, which they're already doing. Like, yes. you know, they, it's all very, comes very natural to them. I think it's, as you become an adult, it starts to sort of get pushed to the edges. Yes. So it's really nice to be able to facilitate it for both the grown ups and, and the babies. Uh, I definitely felt like um, there was 
yeah, I was looking for something like that in my community, like something mm-hmm. outdoors, basically, because yeah. you need to you need to be outside, you need to be in nature. It just sort of helps to soothe everything. <laughs> Your kids come, yeah, it's got has such a calming effect. Um, yeah, and I've noticed it with my little boy. So because we, I didn't even realize I was doing it, but every time I saw a bird, I was never saying, "Oh, look at that bird." I was always saying. Look at that magpie. Look yes. at that blue wren. Yes. Look at that kookaburra. Like, and so very quickly, he doesn't call them birds. He calls them by their by yes. their name. And he even did it with kangaroo grass. So that's amazing. <laughs> so he was like, I, he picked up a piece of like dried out grass. And yes, like, Mama, is it kangaroo grass? And amazing. I was amazing. Like, oh my god, it's success is right there. <laughs> It was like one of my proudest moments. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I just think the kids uh, naturally have that really strong connection to nature. Uh, and, yeah, I think we can really learn a lot from just following their lead. Yeah, because they're on track. They they know that we're a part of nature. They know and they see the, you know, those similarities um so and I don't know if you noticed this when your boy was a baby but when my son was a, a, a real little one he would get fussy and he'd need something but he's dry and he's fed and you don't know what it is and then you'd go outside and it yeah. was everything was calm he was yes. just so relaxed outside yeah some of the best parenting advice for those early days I got was if nothing's working put them get them outside or put them in water <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. Like every time. Yeah. There's something about the sound or the wind or just the the green. I don't know what it is, yeah. but there's some inbuilt calming effect of being I, out there. I think a lot of it's to do with the, it. It's the intensity, like because you, mm. you're indoors a lot, and it's you know it's an intense time. You know if they're unhappy and you're sleep deprived and yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's building, 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 and you're enclosed in this room. Yeah, going outside, it just really, the intensity just kind of is really depleted really quickly. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I sort of feel the same way now. Like my boy is six now and he is happiest when we are out on, especially on the beach or where there's lots of sort of loose parts, like loads of rocks Mm. or sticks or something. And he just makes a game and the game can go on for an hour. Mm. And, you know, he is, you know, when you're, I don't know, maybe you haven't reached, maybe your son's not old enough for this yet. But uh, when I was like pre-baby, I was thinking, my child will never have a screen. He'll never (laughs) eat sugar. He'll be like this wild thing. I'll carry him in a pouch, whatever. (laughs) No, it doesn't happen the way you think. And so he, my son, loves watching a screen. We don't have a TV, but he watches things on my phone. You yeah. know, he likes a screen as much as the next guy, yeah. right? But <laughs> but when we're outside, he, he's so engaged. If we're inside, he says, can I watch something? I'm bored. Yes. What can I do? Da, yeah. da, da. But yeah. when we're outside, there's just like, there's just stuff to do. <laughs> yeah, I feel like um, I always think it, because the the possibilities are just endless. Yeah, it, it, you can tap into your create. You don't even have to be creative. Like it's yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, and nature always delivers as well. Like I always think that's probably my yeah. Like what I enjoy most about camping pre pre kids camping. <laughs> <laughs> Was when you could just sit, yeah, and just yeah, watch and be there. And if, especially like as the sun was setting or something mm. like that, and you found a little nice quiet spot. No, it would just be a matter of time before something came up, and and you know, like some wildlife or something, or yeah. you know, the sun made the clouds do. You know, setting sun made the clouds do something pretty magical, or where you heard a little noise and you're like, what's, like, you know, nature always delivers. So absolutely. Yeah. It's just, you need to actually just, uh, just spend, yeah, spend the time, I guess. Yeah. Sitting and observing and, and actually looking. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So another part of your work is creating habitat gardens and 
creating garden designs for other people and of course this includes native plants and or is <laughs> exclusively native plants. <laughs> yeah. um but i'd love to hear more about that i'd love to hear about transforming the gardens of others into wildlife refuges. yeah this has been great actually i've really loved this side of the business and it's probably something i'll 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 be prioritizing um moving forward because I just think, yeah, like I said, like we've lost a lot of our natural landscape here in South Australia and it's going to continue. Like, yes, we're, we aren't ha as bad as what we were probably, you know, before the 80s and the environmental movement sort of came through, but it's still going to, we're still going to have a growing population, urban sprawl um, and agricultural development, you know, it's just going to keep going. So for me, I just think it's so important to integrate our natural landscape with our urban environment um, and we can do that through plant selection in our gardens like we've we're lucky in Australia where we've got pretty like huge blocks really um, yes even in the a lot of like, space yeah, yeah we've got quite a lot of space uh, and there's so much that you can do with that space to provide basically like stepping stones uh, for the natural environment so if you think about like this patch of bushland over here and it's fragmented and there's, you know, there's just houses and hardscape around it. Uh, if there's nothing else for 20 kilometres or something, it's you're isolating all the wildlife that's using that, that bushland. Whereas if we have little native gardens that are, you know, one in each block kind of thing, they can yes. move across that landscape reasonably safely, which improves the biodiversity. Um, it improves the you know the genetics and the strength of those species so and also I think that putting having a habitat garden in your own home it just brings you so much joy yes uh yeah and 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 you connect with those plants and the birds that are coming to visit and you know at the very least like just put a put a bird bath near mm. a window of your home so every now and again you can have a look at it I'm looking at mine right now actually <laughs> Um, and you have a look at, you know, observe what visitors are coming and, and what you're, you know, you're providing. It's a good feeling. Like it makes you feel yes. really, yeah, yeah. I remember one time we had, we've got these, I don't even know exactly what they are, but I would call them flax plants. And one time, just, just once in the, all the years we've lived here, they, they grew these very, very tall flower spikes and it was better than any bird feeder it was mm. just like it was it, things would come birds would come and then the, they would fly off and then the next species would come it was magical to see is, the yeah. activity and the, the 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 buzz around that flower spike yeah and it, it really is like you build it and they will come yeah. like you put it in there and like that day you'll get yeah. so I've got this beautiful cup gum in my front yard that um yeah, sort of barely survived in its in its pot for about a year or something until we bought our house, and then I put it in the ground and been waiting pretty impatiently for the last two years for it to flower, and it flowered for the first time this year, and it was so exciting. It was like Christmas morning for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had been so I saw the buds appear first, and I was like, oh my god, it's going to flower this year. This is so exciting. I checked every single day for like I think almost three months. <laughs> actually open but then the day that it opened I could because I could see it from my window I was like oh my god there's a flower and it's open and I went out there and there was a native bee inside the flower oh, wow. so, and it was like instantly like yeah. instantly it's they they know it's there and they utilize it and then you get to experience that as well like I just yeah it's exciting it's yeah. like really exciting to be able to provide habitat yeah we made a bee ho what they call a bee hotel one one time mm. which is you know the the um boxes with little bamboo um stems in there with holes and oh my goodness i remember <laughs> going out there like sometime afterwards and so many of the bamboo holes were closed with mud oh, or with wow. a leaf oh. and i was just it was wild to think <laughs> Okay, so we put this out and now it's like a little apartment building with all the doors mm. closed. It was quite astonishing that, you, yeah, you provide a space and along comes the life. Yeah, yeah, and the, I think along comes the life is a really good way of, of saying it. Like 
because I always explain habitat gardens as they're truly living gardens, like mm. they're alive, like mm-hmm. you've got there's things interacting with it um, and it's fostering your connection with it as well. Yeah. And then if it helps for you to have those native plants in your yard and then you can kind of like get to know those native plants, connect with them, and then when it, it's a big motivator for helping to look after them in mm. Know, in the natural landscape like in native bushlands so I just think why wouldn't you <laughs> yeah, why wouldn't absolutely. you just have a garden full of native plants that yeah and what makes that. a good habitat garden design tell me about what the elements are that would make a great habitat garden yeah I think the vegetation layers are really important mm-hmm. so considering from the ground up like your ground covers um little tufty grasses, you know, there's a, they're really good shelter plants for lizards and, and insects as well. And then you've got like small to medium to large shrubs and kind of aiming for that intact, uh, almost like a travel route, I guess, from plant to plant. So the more closely planted you can get it, um, the less exposed the wildlife will feel Mm -hmm. and the more you'll get in your garden really. So if you can kind of cover from ground covers all the way up to a small tree in your yard, uh, that's a really good place to start. And then considering what food you're providing uh, the wildlife through the plants. So if you think about all the different birds and lizards and insects that we have, some of them are insect eaters, some of them are nectar feeders, yes. some of them uh, eat seeds from native grasses, some of them are looking for fruit. So, yeah, really getting to know your native plants and and selecting species that provide all those different uh, diet requirements um, and year-round flowering as well is mm. another um, tip that I always kind of aim for. If you've got something that's flowering at every month of the year, you're going to at least be providing for those pollinating species that they'll just hang around. They won't they'll just be like this place is like heaven on earth I'm never leaving (laughs) and yeah and then you get to experience it you get to see again the changes over the year and the different species that visit different flowers yeah you learn so much like I'm learning all the time like my garden is still in its early kind of stages and yeah I'm I can identify so this year I've been able to identify the months where there's a gap in the flowering um flowering season so and then I'm researching, oh, okay, well, what didn't can we swap, put yeah. in there? <laughs> can I fill that gap with yeah. that in flower right now to keep that uh, consistency? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think those are my, the main things I go for. And local native plants, mm. variety, diversity, yeah, that's really key in a habitat garden I think as well, yeah. Amazing. Hannah, it has just been so inspirational to talk to you. I feel really excited to go out and even explore more of my backyard, attach myself to different native plants and get to know them, put them in my journal. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Thank you, Beth, and it's been a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Hannah. I adored speaking about Australian plants and about the love and care that goes into germinating, growing and planting them, as well as tending to plants in one site and watching the changes that happen through the seasons and the way that nature can restore herself when we just remove the barriers. I also really enjoyed chatting about connecting mums and babies with nature and how important nature time is during these early stages of parenthood and at any stage. Please follow the links in the show notes to find Hannah's website and Instagram to learn more about Wattle and Wonder. Thank you so much for listening. See you next week. (music) 